uh, your coffee all ready, and we'll uh, we'll get set. All right, everyone. This is Jeff Esposito. Uh, I'm the governmental relations analyst for the Arizona School Boards Association. I'm the one that's been harassing you with all those emails. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. We got a, a, a good crowd uh, watching uh, this great presentation. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Chris Thomas, our general counselor, counsel and uh, director of legal and policy services here uh, to kick us off. So, Chris. Thanks, Jeff. Well, it's great to uh, be with everybody. I know we have a, a really uh, big crowd for this topic, and, and this is a topic that, um, especially this time of the year, uh, is very popular. Uh, honestly, besides the open meeting law, this is probably the, the topic that I am called upon and asked to present on the most. So, um, and to make matters, uh, I think, even make it more relevant, uh, this is a, um, a, a concept and an issue that continues to be to evolve. I mean, we have had, I think, uh, legislation that has amended 15.511 every session for the last five or six years. So uh, it's an evolving area of the law, and at the same time, there's no secret that public education and funding for public education uh, continues to, uh, to, uh, to be a, a challenge for us. And so districts are looking at ways to um, help out their their uh, students as best as possible, and uh, going out for overrides and bonds, and uh, because of that, they want to know how to do it the right way. And so, what we're going to talk about today is the uh, the restrictions on the use of school resources to influence the outcome of an election. And what what when I present on this topic, what I try to do is, you know, you can find a lot of lawyers out there that will tell you all the things you can't do, and I will certainly do that. But I want to emphasize the things that you can do because as individuals, as long as you're not using a school resource, you can and, and we would hope that you would be an advocate uh, for public education um, and, um, and do so as long as you're within the lines, um, you, you should feel free to do that. So that's definitely going to be the tenor of this presentation is uh, affirming for you the things that you can do. So let's get started. The statute that we're really dealing with. Uh, let's see if we can. Okay, 15511, which is found in uh, Arizona Revised Statutes. This is the statute that we're dealing with. Um, this is not the only statute that comes into play, however. Uh, we're obviously talking about um, free speech rights. So the First Amendment to the Constitution is part of this, uh, as well as uh, some other uh, statutes that uh, relate to, um, uh, to advocacy in public schools. So let's go through what the statute requires. First of all, it affects all elections. Um, that means it affects school board elections, it affects bonds and override campaigns, it, uh, it affects uh, those initiatives and referendum that go on the ballot that affect education. It also, all of those candidate elections because, uh, you know, are also uh, affected as well. So, and what it does in a nutshell is that it prohibits a person acting on behalf of a school district from using a school resource to, uh, to attempt uh, to influence the outcome of an election. So there's a lot there, and we sort of have to parse it down to understand uh, really the meaning of the statute. So first of all, let's talk about what the definition of influence is, uh, because this did change um, uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago. And... Uh, 
So what is activity that, that actually influences an election? And that's where the, a lot of the rub is in this statute. We have a definition that was offered for us for in 2013, still part of the law, that says that you know, you're influencing if you support or oppose a candidate for nomination or election to public office or recall of a public officer or you support or oppose a ballot measure question or proposition um, in a manner um, that is not impartial or neutral. Now we have some issues with the statute because when you break it down, there's a lot there. I mean, they tried to include every possible uh, kind of election in there. But, you know, how do you support or oppose something in a manner that's impartial or neutral? Um, imp supporting or opposing at the front end supposes that you do not, that you're not impartial or neutral. So that is a statute that is problematic. Um, I do believe that uh, um, it's something that could be litigated. Um, having said that, let's set that aside because uh, this was a statute that was amended when it was amended two years ago. I think those of, uh, that, that did the amendment, I don't think that they really um, understood, uh, you know, that disparity or, or that really that conflict that's internal to the statute is that, uh, you know, you can't support or oppose something in a manner that's not impartial or neutral. So let's just, you know, set that aside because we do have some other standards that we know clearly would violate the law. Um, and Part of that is the Cromco standard, which we will go into now. So th this famous case, the Cromco versus the city of Tucson, um, basically stated that you know express advocacy can be based on uh, it, it, when you advocate, you're, it, it, you basically take a communication as a whole, and that communication should unambiguously urge a person to vote in a particular manner. Um, this is a st this was the statute that was looking at. Um, not just school districts, but also cities and towns and counties and the use of those resources to influence the outcome of the election. And here's the standard that the Cromco um, uh, case stands for. It says the communication must clearly and unmistakably present a plea for action and identify the advocated action. It's not express adv advocacy if reasonable minds could differ as to whether or it encourages a vote for or against a candidate or encourages the reader to take some other kind of action. That's a pretty bright line standard, and that's the standard we lived with clearly until 2013 when those amendments were made to the, uh, the statute that I mentioned. But I think the Cromco standard still is the default. And in fact, um, if you look, there was an attorney general opinion, some of you may have known about this. It came out um, in May, so not that long ago. And the question was posed, from the Yavapai County Attorney's Office, what is activity that, that amounts to an attempt to influence the outcome of the election? And the Attorney General's Office um, looked at, at uh, answered the question fairly straightforward and said, look, the Cromco case says that, in fact, um, it, is the, uh, it is that standard. Uh, the, the Cromco standard is the standard. They ignore, ignored entirely the 2013 amendments about supporting or opposing something in a manner that's not impartial or neutral. Um, however, something interesting happened with this opinion. We were great. We, we loved the opinion because we thought it affirmed the Cromco standard, which is a real clear standard for us to follow. Um, this, this opinion was withdrawn from publication uh, a little less than two weeks after when some of the folks that were proponents of those 2013 amendments um, raised the issue. And so it's now under further review. And we do believe that uh, there'll be some other issued opinion that comes out there. But, um, you know, this is something that we, we need to keep an eye on because, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see if the 2013 amendments are giving more clarity through this opinion in a way that, that restricts um, activity more than what we think it, it, it ought to. So, okay. Getting out of the weeds a little bit, let's go back to what 15511 prohibits. And these are kind of the don'ts of the presentation. And I said I would give you the don'ts, but we're going to focus more on the do's. Um, but here, here's what 15511 prohibits. It prohibits school boards from making statements or submitting arguments in favor of or in opposition to a ballot measure. Now, this does not include overrides, which expressly you have to, you know, under the statute 15481, 
you do provide a statement of support when that goes to the ballot. Basically, you're 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 telling your public, you know, we support going out for an override. Here's what this override would do, um, and then you know the the public can then weigh in on that. Other people can then submit arguments pro and con um, to to sort of um, piggyback on your statement, but that's allowed under the law. And so this general prohibition does not affect that specific one. The general prohibition is that if there were a referendum, if there were an initiative, um, and you know there's discussion of a possible referendum somewhere down the road regarding school funding, um, under 15511, school districts could not pass resolutions in favor or in opposition to that. You could also not uh, pass a, uh, a uh, measure that would support your bond um, because that's not specific to the 15481 uh, uh, language. So that's the that's one statement. Um, the next thing that the the, uh, the statute does is it prohibits school employees when on duty from activities that would influence an election. So a school resource clearly is uh, most of school resources really are in their people, and when their people are on the clock and working. That's a school resource. So how they spend their time um, is definitely something that is a school resource and one that you cannot use that time um, to influence the outcome of the election. And that does restrict us, certainly, uh, but that, that is a very clear line. The next thing is it prohibits the use of school property, including equipment, uh, paper, copiers, buildings, computers, uh, and other act things that are property of the district from being used um, to influence the outcome of the election. So you can't use staff time, you can't use school property. Okay, you also, this was a change that was made, we believe, I think it was in 2011. It prohibits uh, uh, school districts from expending funds for membership in an organization that attempts to influence the outcome of the election. This was specifically targeted at ASBA in retaliation for our um, uh, support of a ballot measure uh, in 2010 um, that um, certain legislators did not like the fact that we supported. Um, and so now uh, ASBA has taken steps. So you can still belong to ASBA and not worry about violating the statute. ASBA does not violate, uh, does not um, uh, support um, or attempt to influence the outcome of election. We do have the friends of ASBA um, which is as a 501c4 and is not funded out of school dues. Um, they have uh, the ability to do that, but not ASBA itself. Um, so uh, we have complied with that law, and you can belong to ASBA and not worry about you um, uh, having uh, not complying with the law by belonging to ASBA. Um, it also prohibits students. Oh, by the way, let me. I should say that I have gotten this question before. What if you belong to a chamber of commerce? And that Chamber of Commerce does attempts to influence election. They endorse candidates. They give money to campaigns. Well, again, it's the same analysis. If it's directly that Chamber of Commerce that you belong to, that would be a violation of the statute. If it is uh, a political arm of the uh, Chamber of Commerce that's a separate entity, um, that would not be a violation of the statute for you to belong to that Chamber of Commerce. Um, you, it also prohibits students from being given campaign material intended intended to influence an election or material intended to influence the outcome of legislation. This is the only part of the statute that applies to pending legislation, um, a broad lobbying effort. You cannot give material to students to take home in any form um, to, uh, to influence an election or to attempt to influence the outcome of legislation. This is a hard and fast rule. And uh, so I do get this question from time to time, especially this last year when we were getting a lot of questions about the budget, uh, whether or not um, information um, that was intended to be um, help with the facts were, uh, whether or not that information could be given to students uh, to take home. And my answer is the same every time. I would never give anything mater material to students, whether it's an expressed call for advocacy or it's just implied through the selective use of facts. Okay, here's a new uh, law. I said this, this statute has been changed every year since, uh, you know, for at least the last six years. And this is one that did pass. 
and it basically says uh, that district promotional expenditures that occur after an election is called through election day, uh, if it's not a routine school district communication, that could violate the statute. So what are we talking about here? Typically what we're talking about is a, a promotional campaign that supports the district or at least says positive things that are happening in the district timed in such a way to influence the, an election that's pending. And so if it was part of a routine communication, something that you put out a quarterly newsletter or a yearly newsletter, um, that would probably be, be okay. But you can't just put out a newsletter like that timed uh, right around the election. And um, because even if it doesn't have an express call for advocacy to vote one way or the other, under this provision that was passed this past year, um, you may violate the statute. So my advice on following this one is to keep those communications regular. You can always say the good things that are happening in the district, but don't do it in, in a manner and a, in a way that um, we that is timed to influence the outcome of the election. So um, also, next, what does 15.511 prohibit? It prohibits the rental and use of a public facility by a private person or entity that may lawfully attempt to influence the outcome of an election. Um, it, it's, uh, this has to do with, a lot of times we have back to school nights or we have other nights where we invite the public uh, to be part of an event. This prohibits uh, a group from renting that public facility at the same time if their use is to influence the outcome of an election. And again, you can see some of these definitely, <laughs> we know that they there was some instance that happened that they wanted to make sure was um, now covered under the statute, and this is one that was like that. So if you have a back to school night, you can't allow the PTO to rent the room next to the back to school night, um, next to the cafeteria at the same time. Um, and the last thing is it's important to know, what is 15.511? The, the, the cost for violating 15.511 changed uh, quite a bit in those 2013 amendments. Um, it went from a $500 fine per violation to $5,000 fine per violation. And the concern about, obviously that's a, 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 a tenfold increase, but in addition to that, um, we have the fact that if you were to violate the statute, it's a personal violation. So your district cannot indemnify you for that fine. Your insurance carrier cannot indemnify you for that fine. So it's a personal violation to you. So that definitely upped the ante in terms of what it really, um, what it really amounts to a, a, a violation. By the way, I am not aware of any uh, instance where this fine has been imposed. Um, not saying it couldn't happen. Um, we definitely need to be mindful of it, but I am not aware of anybody imposing a fine for 15511 violations in the history of the statute. Please don't take that as a green light. <laughs> okay, so we talked about what 15511 prohibits. But let's now talk about what 15.511 does not prohibit. Um, because while the fines have never been imposed, remember that the real penalty for 15.511 violation is the just the specter of a um, of an investigation of a publicity that would really undermine the the debate that ought to happen with regard to the override or bond or whatever the elections issue. It's a distraction that might actually hurt um, the possibility that, that it passes. So that's the real, I think, penalty here that's unspoken. So we don't want, we want to make sure that if, if we are, if people are out there or advocating on an individual basis without using a school district resource, that they do it the right way so that we don't have the specter of a, 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 a allegation of a violation. So here we go. Here's what 15.511 does not prohibit. It does not via, uh, prohibit individual board members or school employees while uh, employees while they're not on duty time um, from exercising their free speech rights and being involved in campaigns. So uh, board members as individuals, you don't have any authority as individuals. You know that from your school board 101 training. As individuals, you can do and say anything you want out there 
uh, on a, a school elections issue or on any elections issue. What you can't do is use the time when you're on, acting as a board to do that very same thing. Uh, because then you have authority, then you're acting as a board. Um, and school employees, again, if you're not on duty, uh, you can exercise your free speech rights and be involved in campaigns um, to the full extent allowed under the First Amendment and under the law. School district employees can receive campaign information in school district email accounts and mailbox from outside non-school senders. Okay, so it's just the receipt. If, if you allow communications on other issues through email portals or through mailboxes, you have to also allow those communications that are of a political nature if they are coming from an outside source. Okay, it's a it's a First Amendment issue. Now, what's important to know though is the employees once they receive that information, they can't forward that through email accounts. They can't print it off if it's a, an attachment, like a flyer, um, and they can't forward it to other other people. They can also, um, if, the, if it's a mailbox kind of thing, they can't distribute that communication on, on duty time to other employees. But just the receipt alone from an outside source, that's okay under the, under the uh, Attorney General guidelines. Okay, outside groups, including uh, parent-teacher organizations, may organize or use school buildings to have meetings in support of a campaign, providing those groups lease the facilities in the manner that any other group would be allowed to, to lease. Working through the district policy, you have to ask for the time, you have to pay for the time, PTOs can meet on campus, being that they're an outside group, and um, in support of a campaign. Individuals can exercise their free speech rights by politicking or flyer distribution at an event which occurs in which the public at large is welcome, so long as all groups are welcome to engage in such activity. So if you have somebody engaging in, you know, expression of, you know, you have, you have a group where it's a football game, but you want to, the volleyball group and the band group want to put flyers on cars or cars or distribute flyers at that event where they are promoting their activity or a car wash or something like that it's a fundraising activity political activities have to be uh, allowed on the same basis um, as long as they don't disrupt the event and as long as they're following all the other rules of the law uh, of your policies as well uh, school districts can remind their patrons that there is an election coming up without giving uh, and give that and give that date and without so long as they don't suggest how they vote okay um, they can urge people to vote in an election without telling them how to vote okay so your billboards that say election November 2nd uh, that's not the election I don't, date, I don't think this day <laughs> this year but whenever the election is in November you can tell them that there's an election on that day again so long as you don't tell them how to vote um, and uh, even suggest that, you're fine. Uh, board members and school employees on school time can answer questions from a factual perspective on the impact of a school district uh, depending on the election's outcome. So, so you have a patron call and say, um, I'm kind of wondering how I should vote on this override. Can you give me some information about what the override would, that those funds would be used for? The safest course of action in that instance is to provide them a copy of the argument that you provided for 15481 or point them to a place where they can get it um, without responding. Um, now you, what you don't want to do is skew the facts such that you're not giving a complete picture of what in fact the, you know, the, the uh, election would be because on one hand, yes, would, would the money go to some worthwhile um, uh, uses? Yes, they may. But there, there's a, an issue as to whether, you know, would your taxes go down if the override did not pass? Eventually, yeah, probably they would. And so you want to make sure that you gave those facts as well. So you want to make sure that you, you stick to the facts, use that 15481 um, uh, argument when you can. 
Okay, so here's a big question that comes up, and it comes up all the time, and it's coming up with greater frequency. When does 15.511 apply? So not only what what is an attempt to influence, but when does the statute apply? Because remember, an attempt it's about an attempt to influence an election. So here's this is something lifted right from the guidelines. Um, it applies to activities after an election has been called. Certainly, we know that. But it also applies to activities that occur before an election has been called. This is from directly lifted from the Arizona AG guidelines. It says, the phrase also applies to activities leading up to qualifying ballot measures and, and candidates for the ballot, including fundraising and attempts to qualify a measure for the ballot to circulations of petitions relating to candidates or ballot measures, including recall petitions. In other words, it's not a, a free-for-all before the election has actually been called by the board. Uh, the activities that lead up to that, that moment are, are um, under scrutiny under the statute as well. Um, so, and again, I know that, that some folks have, have a different impression about that, but I'm just, I'm telling you what the Attorney General guidelines state and I, how I believe the legislature would, would view it um, if activities prior to an election were, that were, were done in a, clearly in a way in an attempt to influence and shape that election, um, we would have an amendment to the, to the statute for sure. Here's the, 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 the also the rub, and I sort of just throw this out there as, as kind of a question. The 2015 amendments, which I just mentioned that were in House Bill 2613, uh, I don't think this was intended by the statute. In fact, I'm sure that it wasn't intended by the statute. But they, they define routine communications. Uh, that, that, that statute prohibits you from doing communications, promotional communications, but, but after an election has been called and before the election. So they seem to be drawing a line between when the election's been called and before the election is some magical time when the Attorney General guidelines have said that's not a magical time. So the issue is, does this get muddied a little bit by the fact, by these amendments? I think one could, could argue that it has been because something se seems to be magical about the time when we call the election. Uh, my advice is still to proceed, however, that... Um, Activities that are before the election has been called, if they would be a violation after the election would be called, will subject you to a uh, at least an allegation of a violation. And uh, I, I would certainly, to be on the safe side, urge you to, to avoid those. Okay, so this is a statute, though, that's very short. And, and where we, you know, how you learn the most about it is to really look at, at the, at, you know, particular scenarios and whether or not something is a violation or not a violation. So really the bulk of my time is going to be talking about uh, frequently asked questions that we have with regard to uh, this statute. And I would encourage you uh, to submit a question of your own because, again, this is where we, how we, we learn the most is when we, we're, we're testing out um, the statute and, and certain activities that may uh, be a violation. So here's the first one. Okay, the first question is, can a person use their title in support of an issue, say a letter to the editor signed by the superintendent? Um, yes, um, though the best practice is to state that the letter is not being written on behalf of the district. Again, that's I don't believe that's required, um, but it certainly makes it easier to avoid the allegation of a violation. Um, you, however, know that you can't use uh, be on duty when you write this letter. You can't use any school resources like computers or email accounts to transmit this letter. Um, you can't print out this letter at school and then mail it using district postage. These are all kind of obvious things in the production of it. But if you're on your own time, you're on your own computer, you're using your own email account, you certainly could submit a letter to the editor and sign it, um, you know, as the superintendent. Um, again, I think that a best practices to say that you're acting as an individual, but I don't think necessarily the law requires it. Okay, can you post election info on school marquees? Yes, you can put the election date, you can ask your people to vote, um, but you can't suggest to them or uh, how to vote. 
Can school employees receive election-related material in school boxes, uh, mailboxes, or on school district computers, or in a school-provided email account? Um, yeah, they can. As long as the law allows for the receipt of such materials, so long as the district has a policy allowing for the receipt of outside non-school-related messages. Now, one of the questions I have gotten recently has to do with the use of like a Gmail account, like a Google account or a Yahoo account. Um, same analysis applies. I mean, yes, that's a separate um, email account. It's not on district servers. But if you access that through a, a government computer, you're using a district resource. So even though it's on a Yahoo account, even though it's on a Gmail account, you're going to have to access that on your own computer on your own time. Um, the other thing is, um, and it's real easy to do, obviously, with email, is, you know, things go viral really quickly, and that's part of advocacy. You want them to go viral, but you can't use the school district resources to make that happen. So school employees can't forward those emails to anyone. They can't print out those messages on district print, uh, printers or using district paper. So a, a good practice when you do send, uh, if you're an outside group and you do send something in into um, to employees um, under this provision is provide uh, some suggested language on the bottom that says, and I, I provided that for you there where it says, please don't forward, please don't print, please don't, you know, use um, uh, any school resources to influence the outcome of the election. It's a disclaimer that I think is, is, is good to have at the bottom of your emails. So, can a, a parent or employee have a political or election-related bumper sticker on a car in a parking lot? Yes, this is specifically allowed under the Attorney General guidelines. Where this has become an issue is how, is there a breaking point? I mean, if you put up actual yard signs as your sunshade in your car, or if you um, have decked out your entire car um, in pro-election messages, are those allowed? Well, at some point, there may be a slippery sl slope to a violation, particularly if you park the car in a prominent place, you do not move it, um, and the district approves or gives you special access to showcase the car. Clearly, that would be using a school district resource. But the question is, do we, do we cross a line at some point between individual expression and um, district-sponsored speech? And I, I think that the... The yard signs and sunshades are okay. I think that's along the lines of a bumper sticker. Um, I think that where we have a problem is if you have a prominent parking space, you're giving preferential parking parking space, or if the district has looks to like it uh, endorses that um, speech in any way. Oh, we just talked about that. Okay, can teachers wear uh, uh, T-shirts or buttons to school in support of or opposition to a ballot measure? Can board members wear T-shirts or buttons in support of a ballot measure to a board meeting? And the answer to both those questions is no. Um, when you're on district time or you're acting under the color of the authority of the board collectively, you cannot engage in advocacy messages. Uh, can community members or parents or school employees pass out material in support of an op or opposition to a candidate or a ballot measure at school or at school sponsored events? Um, it, it depends, basically. Um, if the event is where the public is not generally invited, like during the school day, uh, the parent or community members would have to stay off school premises to hand those things out. Um, so they couldn't use a school resource at all. Uh, school employees would could also participate if they were off duty in that activity. If it's a extracurricular event where the public is invited, then the parents and the school employees that are off duty um, but do not have any supervisory activities or responsibilities, they can come on campus and pass things out so long as all sides are allowed to do so and it's consistent with your policy and it doesn't disrupt the event. Can the district distribute factual information about the impact of a ballot measure to the public? Yes. But remember, all facts have to be presented fairly, completely, and without bias. And if at all possible, those materials should stick to the financial numbers closely and avoid any editorial comment. Um, 
You should also be careful about um, making the argument that certain things will happen if something doesn't pass. Um, we've had this before where uh, school employees have said, well, if the override doesn't pass, we're going to lay off 10 teachers. Well, if the board has has provisionally approved that, should that occur, that would be a factual statement. If the board has not, and, that, and that's a potential ac um, action by the board, then you're you're being uh, you're you're providing editorial comment. You're skewing the facts in such a way to try to influence. So I would not make such statements like that. It's going to have to be something that, you know, a program clearly disappears if the override doesn't pass, and you could state that. Um, those employees, however, might be reassigned, and if that's a possibility, I wouldn't make the statement that they might they would be laid off if the override doesn't pass. Can schools send home factual information with students for their parents to read? Um, this is one where the law is very clear. Even though it's factual, I would not, if, it's, if it could be in any way seen as an attempt to influence an election, I would not use students as the conveyance to get material to parents. Even if it, if it relates to the election or legislation, I would not give that to parents. I would find some other avenue, either through the the regular mail or through email, not through the students, to get that information out. But um, I just think that there's such a bright line with using students as a conveyance that uh, I would avoid that. Uh, can teachers, school staff, or administrators discuss their support or for or opposition to a candidate or issue-based ballot measure during the course of the school day and at official events? Well, among you know, this is a, a free speech issue. Teachers amongst themselves can um, talk about the news of the day. Um, it, the fact of the matter is, is that it would be probably be a violation of their their free speech rights to preclude them from doing that. However, that's different than organizing. That's different than having a rally or an organizational meeting or a, a promotional meeting during the school day where the where the teachers or the employees are on the clock. Now, there, the door may be open there, though, if the, 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 it's during the school day and the teachers are on a, um, on a break where they don't have any duties. That, that would be different. Um, so uh, remember, that's the bright line. Is that, you know, if it's at school events or, or um, during the teaching day then, or during a teaching period, then you are a limited because that becomes government-sponsored speech, and that's what the statute precludes. Now, could you have an elections kind of discussion with your students where, um, you know, where your opinion was offered? I'd be very careful about that, but you certainly could, um, you know, engage students and, and have students be part of the um, engagement process because that's what we want to encourage without you know, telling them how to vote or, or suggesting, um, you know, uh, that they're, you know, they tell their parents to vote in a particular way. Um, all of that's okay, but you just want to avoid the, the statements that where it's clearly an attempt to, to influence. Can school buildings be used by outside groups for campaign related activities? Yes, absolutely they can as long as that facility is rented at the going rate under the district's community use of facilities policy. It's found in your, in your policies. It tracks the statute, which is 15.1105. Um, and again, um, this includes parent-teacher organizations. Now, I know parent-teacher organizations typically meet for free um, on school district premises as they're having a regular meeting. However, if the purpose of that meeting, any part of it, is to influence the outcome of election and to discuss the election, that changes the nature of that meeting and you can't provide free use. You've got to require that, that they rent the facility uh, for the time at least that they are uh, going to be talking about the election. By the way, if, if an anti-group side wants equal time and they're willing to pay their, their price as well, they, they've got to be given access as well. Can a school district or school have a campaign forum on ballot measures or candidates where all sides are represented? Absolutely. That's specifically allowed under the Attorney General guidelines, but remember, and you don't have to have any rental charges in that at all, 
um, as long as all sides are represented. Um, the question I always get about this is what happens if one side was invited to participate but they're not there? Um, I think that changes the, the event from a forum to an advocacy session. And so it, you're going to really have to shake the bushes to find somebody to, to represent the, the anti side. Um, if you want to use the forum exception. If you don't have that, I think you're under the general um, rule where uh, you, you've got potentially an advocacy situation and you want to make sure that uh, that the proper rental charges have been applied. Um, can, a, can the band or cheerleaders perform at a ballot measure rally? Uh, yeah, they can, but they've got that that participation has to be fully voluntary. It can't be during the school day, and the students um, cannot be provided for district uh, paid for uniforms uh, for that purpose or instruments. So if they own their own instruments, they rent their own instruments, they they bought their own um, clothing, then certainly they could do that. Can teachers take parent emails and send a pro or anti? Uh, ballot measure message from their own computers at home when they're not on school duty. Yes, I believe that they can, but the email addresses themselves have got to be obtained through a public records request. So if that is indeed a public record in your district and has been deemed it so, that teacher, even though they have access to those emails in some other way, should at least make a public records request and go through the proper channels to get them once they, have, once they have to receive them, they can indeed um, send that email uh, to parents uh, using an outside email account. They can even identify themselves as a teacher. The best practice would be that they state clearly that they're not acting as um, the teacher, they're not being paid for it, and they're not acting on behalf of the district or the school. Can a school board adopt a resolution in favor of or opposed to a ballot measure? We answered that pretty quick, clearly. No, they cannot. Can, a civics, can civics educators discuss ballot measures as part of a kid's voting program or other type of program to teach students about the political process? Absolutely, they can. Um, so long as the instructor follows the curriculum that is neutral in its approach, while the students engage and they offer their opinions, they certainly can. Um, can do that. Um, and it could be about, you know, school elections as well. The students are free to, to exercise their First Amendment rights as, and, and state what they, they, uh, they believe. Now, one of the questions I have gotten before is if as part of one of these activities, we urge students to write a letter um, to the editor in support of a ballot measure or a candidate, um, that would be fine. So long as it's not coordinated, no, no one particular point of view is pushed, and if the student takes a contrary view, that student has to be um, made to feel every bit as welcome as those that are uh, promoting a different view. Can voter registration material be given out by schools? Um, yes. But that material should be available all the time, not just around the time of an election, not in connection with any kind of particular advocacy effort. If a school gives out space to an outside group for free under the community use policy where the activity supports the school's educational mission, can that outside group allow campaigning by a ballot measure? I think I talked about this already. No, they can't. If the, the focus of that particular meeting is an advocacy, uh, focus, then uh, that has to be, uh, you have to go through rental uh, and they have to pay compensation for that. Do 15511 restrictions apply to charter schools? Yes, they do. Um, in fact, mo while most of Title 15, there's no reference to charters um, other than those statutes that apply to charters specifically, 15511 specifically makes reference to charter schools as well. So they do have to follow all of these rules as well as all school district or neighborhood uh, public schools. Uh, can pro-ballot measure signs be placed on school campuses on election day if the ballot, if the campus is being used as a polling place? Yes. What you've done is created a limited public forum. 
And so those signs, as long as they adhere to all the regulations with regard to those signs, have to or can be displayed even though they're on school premises. Uh, I think there's the, uh, the, the the 500 foot rule or something like that. Um, as long as it's it, it's everybody is given the same access, that's okay. But only on on election day, not on you know you know leading up to the election day. Uh, can students attend ballot measure rallies held on school campuses? Yes, but they, their, their participation has to be voluntary. The information about the rally cannot be distributed using school resources or during the school day. Um, and don't forget, if it is a rally held on school campus, you know, there's got to be a rental charge as well for that to actually occur. Can districts have a forum where only facts and local impacts will be discussed regarding ballot measures? Yes, but this one's uh, fraught with with pitfalls here. I would say that you know it, extra care has to be taken to ensure that there's a, a just the facts presentation. Um, it's got to be a full examination of all the facts and not just certain facts. Um, but to me, why do this? Why? Why? Um, because I think it's a real danger, uh, dangerous thing to do, the safest thing to do would be to have an issues forum, have all sides represented, and then you don't have to worry about any of the statements or, or selective facts coming out that is skewed in such a way that it has an advocacy message. Can education organizations endorse and support ballot measures? Um, not if they have school districts as dues paying members, they can. Um, so. Uh, Basically, if, you, if you're not funded by school districts and you are an education organization, you can do this. And that's why, again, ASBA started the Friends of ASBA as an affiliated but not controlled organization. Um, can uh, school district employees be expected to support a ballot measure in their free time? Absolutely not. You can't, um, you can't uh, in your supervisory capacity, urge employees to be involved in their free time or um, punish them for being involved on the other side of an issue. Um, you absolutely can, you know, you, you can't um, prompt them at all to be involved in an advocacy campaign. It's, it's got to be their own volition entirely. Um, can school district, school employees give out information such as directory information of students or lists of school vendors to an outside group for campaign purposes? Um, this is a this is a sensitive subject, but in in the legal analysis of this, I do believe they can, so long as they do it the right way. If that information is deemed to be um, public record or directory information that is given out for other purposes, I do believe that it could also be given out for uh, to an advocacy group if they go through the proper channels, make the proper public records request, and it's given to them as they would be given to any other group, um, like for somebody who had a commercial purpose, for instance. Now, there has been legislation that would amend that, but as, as of yet, that has not passed, and this is the state of what the law is today. Can, last question, at least the last question that I've got prepared, uh, can a campaign or school district poll can, can, a, can a campaign or a school district poll to determine message and targeting? Well, that depends on the type of poll. It's one thing to, if you're contemplating going out for a bond or an override uh, election and you want to find out the kinds of programs and um, uses that folks would support, that's okay. Um, however, what you would not want to do is do a push poll. What you're, what you're, when you're essentially trying to do is prompt people to support something. It's, it's in the guise of a poll, but what, an enact, enact, what it really is is an advocacy message attempt to move people to one side or the other. And what does that, what is that? Well, it's one of those things where you know it when you see it and when you hear it. Um, you know, when you, when you, when you say, when you, when you hear a push poll, a classic push poll would be the commercial to say, you know, um, uh, call President Obama today and tell him you oppose a particular thing. Um, and that call, you know, is a um, is really an attempt to to oppose, you know, and it's done in election time. So what, in essence, it is it's a negative campaign against the candidate. 
So that, that that's one where you know we, we know it when we see it, and those kind of messages using school resources would be seen as an attempt to influence, even though they may be allowed under campaign finance law. So okay, well let's get to your questions because I'm interested in seeing what you what you've got. And actually, Chris, uh, I wanted to make sure uh, you all checked out these uh, uh, resources for other questions or, or information. You know, the recorder's office and the county superintendents. Uh, oftentimes are, are, are pretty good resources uh, for these things beyond here. So here's some contact information and some, some URLs. Uh, and just I'll, I'll leave it here for a second while we, we pull up uh, your questions if you want. Uh, make sure to, to fill out uh, the, the box there um, with, with questions here. Uh, we're, we've got some here already. Um, so uh, there, there's one here, uh, what about giving students campaign materials outside of school hours and off school property and what if those students are voting age? Okay, well the, the danger of do, giving students material even off of school hours and, and off school property is that the district is still responsible for the students to and from school. And so I do believe that, that I would not advise that you do that. Um, if it's a district doing it. Now, if it's a PTO doing it, they can do that. But the district itself should not do that. Um, so does that mean that school employees need uh, to check each and every group that they might be a, a member of? Um, well, the difference is, okay, so we have different kinds of organizations in the state. We have an organization where, like ASBA, where the district itself is a member. We have other organizations in which... Um, you know, the actual employee is a member, but the district may pay the dues. Um, where the district pays the dues, that's a little different. Um, I, I think the analysis would be a little different, but um, even so, I know that ASBO, the, the school business officials, and the, the, the school administrators have all complied with 15511, even though I think it's, you know, that it's an open question as to whether or not th those amendments um, apply to them in the same way it does to ASBA. Uh, is uh, teacher's prep time or break slash lunch considered their own time? It, uh, prep time, clearly not. Uh, that is not their own time. But if it's a break time where you have no supervisory duties whatsoever um, and you are free to do what you want, um, then you can engage in political activities at the same time. But remember, you're going to probably be engaging somebody else as well um, and you also have school resources all around you, um, you just can't use any of those. But your time itself, you can uh, engage in political activity during that time if you have no um, responsibilities uh, during that time. I, I think you kind of covered this one, but I, it's, it's popping up a few times. What defines the time of a student? Okay, the time of the student would be from the time they leave their house till the time they get back to their house. Um, that's uh, now the, the time of an employee. That's a different question too. That that that's defined by at least at a minimum the professional day, um, as it's defined in your policy. But it may extend beyond that depending on what kind of job you have. Um, clearly, principals and superintendents don't exactly have you know uh, you know seven to four jobs, um, and uh, so that the, it's urged that if principals or superintendents are engaged in uh, political speech, um, even if it's outside of those times, that they, uh, other than say weekends or nights or something like that, that they actually um, take leave time to engage in that. Um, that happens a lot sometimes when you have a, a like a chamber of commerce or a rotary meeting. Um, you certainly could attend and, and advocate, but you'd want to take leave time to do that. Uh, can flyers be dropped off by parents at schools to, or by advocates at schools to be distributed in staff mailboxes? Um, what they should do is distribute themselves. They should have, ask for access to the mailboxes to distribute. The problem would be if you just drop them off and somebody else distributes it, that somebody else is probably on the clock and you know you, you would have a violation. What you'd want to have is access to distribute them the, yourself. Can an association PAC be a guest speaker at a staff meeting? Um, not if they, the, the intent of their, uh, their speech is to advocate for an election. 
All right. Uh, can a student's voice be used to make a robocall reminding the community to vote? Sure. As long as the student is not compelled to do so, they don't record it during the school day, and it's it, again, it's completely voluntary. Um, that that would be all right. What if a parent organization does a short statement for the ballot measure during their meeting? Does that organization still need to rent the facility, or does the exception come into play? Um, I think I, I you know. It's sort of an open question whether the entire meeting is sort of tainted or just that portion of the meeting where it was discussed. I, I think you'd be on safe ground to say that just the portion of that meeting. Um, I attend my own daughter's PTO meetings and we've had that happen. You know, we've had somebody come on to, to advocate. Um, they're fairly benign, but they do it and, and, it's, and it's fine and they pay for the rental charge just for that portion of the meeting. Um, can can employees have their vehicles with uh, glass paint uh, with the with their glass painted parked on school property um, with support or opposition message? Okay, this is the one that's that's open for interpretation. My opinion is that they can do that. It's just like a, a bumper sticker. The question would be to does the district support that in any way? Do they give them preferential parking? Do they you know does the employee park it and just leave it there in front of the school for the entire month of you know October? Um, those kind of things would would be a violation, but just coming to and from work and you have some pro-election messages, um, I believe they're allowed, but I will tell you this, if you're looking to avoid the allegation, and that's your standard, um, that is one that people will not understand. You know, as people come on your school district campuses, they don't understand that that's your own free speech and the district is not sponsoring that. So you'll get an allegation, you'll win, but do you want the allegation? That's what you got to ask yourself. Can pro override signs be put across the street from schools, but uh, not on school property? Absolutely, sure. Are teachers allowed to collect parent signatures for a candidate's petition for office well on school property, but after school? Are teachers allowed to collect parent signatures for a candidate's petition for office while on school property, but after school? Um, that's a tough one because on, on, you know, the, the parents are very much going to see you as being a teacher and acting on behalf of the school. Um, I think what you could do is to say that, look, I'm, this is, I'm doing this as an individual, not as a teacher and not, um, under the instruction of the district, you're, you're free to do this or, or free to sign it or not sign it. Um, I think that would give you a little bit firmer ground. But I am uncomfortable with it. Um, you know, if you're a teacher on school district premises and you're engaging a parent who's going to always see you as that, um, so. Are our parent? This is this is a big question that I, I've heard a lot. Are parent council 501c3s or PTSOs, PTAs, uh, uh, limited to what they can or uh, do or not to promote overrides? That's a great question. Um, yes, they are, but not under 15511. If you're a 501c3, you can engage in a limited amount of lobbying. Um, that typically amounts to about 20% of your budget um, can be spent on lobbying. So if you created a PTO and called it a PTO and made it a 501c3 and spent all of your money on an override, you're going to have a problem with the IRS. Um, but if you if it was a limited amount of your funds, um, you know. It, Basically, influencing an, uh, an issue-based campaigns amounts to lobbying. It's the same thing. Um, what if a student organization wants to advocate for an election? Uh, how would this impact the club sponsor? Could they get in trouble if their students are active? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, a, a troubling situation because, again, it is a school-sponsored activity, and at the same time, it's, it's school it's it's in um, you know students acting on their own, but when you have a school sponsor, you're given free access to the school uh, school facilities. Uh, I would urge the students to act on their own uh, or create uh, some separate organization that is um, not sponsored by the school in any way. All right. Um, can school districts or employees create factual infographics about bonds and overrides to help with uh, their understanding, and can they be posted on websites to social media sites or be available as printed materials? 
Uh, they can do that, but at the same time, I, again, look, watch for the selective use of facts and watch for, um, you know, I wouldn't post it on, on your social media site. They can so post it on their own. Um, and I would also, again, watch making that a class activity um, where, you know, that they're asked to do this. Because if, it, if, it, if it's something that you're prompting students to, to do, and they believe there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, then you know, you're putting the district really at risk. Can a teacher's association do a letter of support if their dues are paid through district payroll by employee request? Yes. Okay. Um, will a hard copy of this be available for download? So yes, we'll have uh, both a recording of this presentation and a uh, PDF copy of the PowerPoint available on our website uh, a little bit later. Can uh, non-employee uh, collect mail-in ballots at schools? Um, yes, they can, um, but uh, you know they can't interfere with the function of the school, uh, and you know it should be done in a way that that is you know sensitive to the fact that there's school going on. Uh, at a parent-teacher conference, can what would happen if a, a teacher tells parents that the reason uh, why class sizes are so large is because the last override failed? That's not a violation. Um, now, if they coupled that with this is why we have to pass the next override, then we've got a problem. I would, however, you know, there's a professionalism issue there. I wouldn't, I would urge them not to say things like that. Um, however, um, I don't think it's a violation of 5511. Uh, school administrators work is uh, less defined than hourly employees. Is it acceptable for administrators to work to influence an election after the quote unquote normal work day has ended? Well, it depends on what it is. I mean, if, if it's just routine acting as a voter, acting as an engaged citizen, I think you can do any of those kinds of things. Where I would, um, you know, if you're going to go there as an official capacity, however, say again to a Rotary or Kiwanis or something like that or some function where you're speaking as a principal or a superintendent, just to make it clean, I would ask for an hour off um, just to make it clear that you weren't acting on behalf of the, uh, of the school. Uh, where can interested community members receive information regarding forming and operating a uh, override election pack? Uh, well, that, that's found, you know, with, with uh, county elections, they have a lot of information there. And uh, Jeff, obviously, he's, uh, Jeff does work for, um, he obviously works for ASBA, but he also, through uh, the Friends of ASBA, um, again, he's not advocating, but he's making sure that you have the tools to advocate if you want to. Um, what are the boundaries uh, for getting involved uh, at our children's PTA? Um, well, you can get involved as you want. Uh, you know, are you talking about, I guess the question is whether or not as a staff member or as a, uh, a parent. Um, I don't see any, any boundaries there at all, just being involved. Um, can an employee present factual information only to a community organization which meets during the employee's normal lunch hour, and is it okay to print factual information sheets using uh, district computers printers to be passed out at such a meeting? Yes, but the devil's in the details. Is it truly factual? Is it, or is it a selective use of facts? You've got to say all sides of it. Um, that's one where, especially if it's an override, you know, you've already got that statement that you have to provide and it's already been vetted by your counsel. I, I would provide them that and no more. All right. Uh, is it still considered the use of school resources when you request time off to do advocacy work, but still get paid for your leave from the school district? Or does it have to be leave without pay? It does not have to be leave without pay. That's your own time. Even if you're getting paid, that's part of your, you know, if you're free to do other things, you're free to engage in that, that political activity. All right. Um. What is what is uh, uh, the the easiest violation to fall victim to? The easiest violation to fall victim to um, is clearly the you know uh, to me it would it would it would be you know uh, um, a 
the, that engagement of a parent as a teacher, um, you know, it's it's a it's a hopefully it's a friendly conversation. It's a it's a comfortable conversation, and the parent is going to say, you know, um, hey, I see that we have this override. Uh, can you tell us how, how it would affect you? And if you said some statement about how it's really important that we pass this because you know I got three percent raise riding on it or whatever, that would be an easy violation. You just have to know what hat you're wearing at a particular time. Uh, and I think this will probably be the last question. Um, can board members on their own time hand out pro override flyers at football games and sporting events? Absolutely, as long as you're doing it consistent with what how other people are able to do such activity and you're not disrupting the event. All right. Okay, well, thank you all for participating in this. Um, hope it's been helpful. If you, uh, we continue to be a resource. Obviously, Jeff's the resource for you and your advocacy efforts. But if you have other questions for me, I'm happy to answer them um, if I can. Um, and uh, we want to just end by saying, look, 15511, while it is, um, it is, it definitely has teeth to it, and it does restrict the use of school resources by somebody acting on behalf of the school district does not preclude you from being an advocate uh, and uh, for supporting uh, public education so long as you know what the rules are. And we urge you to know what the rules are and then get out there and uh, do what you want to do.